Parker, expected approach time 34, approach button 17, the altimeter 299 or 7. G'day, and welcome back to the DCS Situation Report. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and I'm coming to you live from Australia. And I do hope this video finds you well wherever you're tuning in from today. For those of you familiar with the channel, this makes a second video for me this week, the first of which showcased a few things Razbam has been working on with their fantastic South Atlantic map. So do check out that video if you haven't already. And while we're all about maps, yep, you guessed it, we have a fourth map announced this year, the top end of Australia. It's going to be a pretty big map at 1400 by 800 square kilometers and will feature parts of both the northern and Western territories, as well as the city center of Darwin. Naturally, the area will be a rich geographic environment with coastlines, floodplains, lakes, and rivers. And from the air, we can avoid tangling with saltwater crocodiles, snakes, and spiders that typically festoon these areas. Get out of it, you mongrel. Sadly, I haven't been this far north on the mainland, but for the uninitiated, Australia is a massive country, almost the same size as the continental United States, but much less densely populated. This is largely to do with the fact that most people are terrified of living there, and the vicious wildlife prevents the population from spreading in conjunction with the heat. New Zealand, which is a far less treacherous place to live, avoids overpopulation by getting confused for an island off Australia's coast, and prior to Lord of the Rings, no one had actually heard of it. Getting back to the Aussie tropics, the map is produced by Czech Six Simulations. The team are also producing unique and detailed models of infrastructure to properly represent the infrastructure of the region. It includes Mindel Beach, Darwin, Broome, Tyndall, Curtin, and Delamere Weapons Range. The Top End Australia map will give DCS players a unique experience to hone their skills across air, land and sea domains, allowing simulations of real-world exercises such as Pitch Black, according to ED. Now that exercise is hosted by the Royal Australian Air Force biannually and features up to 2,500 personnel and 100 aircraft from a variety of nations. Did I say biannual? I think I meant biennial, which is every second year. Now, they include those countries or nations that are taking part in the pitch black exercise. Obviously, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Indonesia, India, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Netherlands, Philippines, Republic of Korea, Singapore, Thailand, UAE, US and UK forces, and significantly, I believe, this year they had Germany, Japan, and the uh, Republic of Korea for the first time. So, obviously, with changing political dynamics in the Pacific these days, these exercises have become, unfortunately, increasingly important. Now, regardless of the real-world issues, the map where we're going to get in DCS World, along with the various others released or announced recently showcase some really interesting things that we need to take notice of regardless of whether you support them or not. Firstly, it indicates that we now have a much broader base of developers willing to make maps for DCS World, which we haven't had in the past. Secondly, these developers are showcasing that the game engine is capable of recreating a wide variety of terrains and environments from around the globe. This is both beneficial for DCS players, but also mission designers and campaign content creators who can expand their creative endeavors and amalgamate new territories into exciting theaters of combat, fictitious or historical. But you ask, Anthony Cleopatra, where's the Vietnam map for the love of God, ED? And in a Twitter post today, ED poked a little fun at Tricker who of course asked the same question, where is the Vietnam map? And of course themselves, they replied, Everyone, we want Vietnam. ED, this is what this third party picked for their first map. Vietnam will come at some point. So there you have it. Vietnam will come at some point. 
And with that answer, you can all shut up. Oh, wait. What's that? Somebody asked. Is the silence on the Vietnam map indicative of the possibility that ED is developing it? ED's response? <gasps> He's on to something. Wait, what do you mean you're not satisfied? You want your Phantom and Vietnam too? Sheesh. Well, stay tuned, you greedy bastards, because we need to wait for Heat Blur and Edie to get together and make some magic. Fingers crossed. All joking aside, the news about maps right now, including the Australian one, is obviously outstandingly positive for both Edie and the DCS franchise, as I've already explained. So stay tuned for more information on the development of these maps, which, by way of reminder, now include the Kola Peninsula, Sinai, Australia, and of course, the South Atlantic map, which is actually out and in early access already. Cloud there. No Delta Strand, Hawk 401, 2810, take a runway, 3 right for departure, will be off to the west, Alice. Let's turn to other news stemming from the massive changelog this week, which came in the form of a hefty patch from the ED team, who are churning out a lot of changes. As is the way with these big patches, it's too extensive for me to tackle every single item, but here are a couple of highlights that I think are worth discussing. They have included some new physics to the cooling systems, and additional damages have been added to the following World War II aircraft. The Mosquito the P-47D, P-51D, FW-190A8, and FW-190D9. Now, the update centers on a boiling physics system that is based on temperature and pressure. This results in natural boiling of these pressurized closed-loop systems. Battle damage boiling can now be caused by drastic pressure drops from punctures. You can see this as steam effects coming from an airframe, bullet holes, or warbirds, except... The Spitfire and the BF-190K4 currently have this update. Now, actually, on my way to work today, I saw someone driving a car with a pall of steam trailing as it flew down the fast lane, demonstrating this effect quite impressively. I didn't see the end result, which is less common in modern vehicles, but I suspect the result was going to be very similar somewhere down the road, basically catastrophic engine failure in the nose cone. Now, the F-16 received a huge list of changes this week, including the auto-lazing function mentioned in previous weeks, as well as some aesthetic features like the exhaust gas door animation for the gun and the animation of the barrel. Incidentally, the Vulcan 20mm Gatling cannon shoots 6,000 rounds per minute, but there is in fact a 0.3 second spool up of the gun, which means that it only shoots 70 rounds in the first burst. Now that spool up time is worth noting as you line up your shot, because there is a slight delay, and as also the gun clears itself, some rounds are actually fed back into the return system, and effectively are lost to you. Now it fires so quickly it's impossible to count the individual rounds and is comparable to a heavy concrete drill. It's a pretty amazing piece of engineering. On to other aircraft, as mentioned previously the Mi-24P now has a, its first voiceovers for the Petrovich system. And those have been introduced and there are more on the way so right now it has the same number of voices as the AH-64D which of course is another fantastic ED product. Not an ED product, but still part of the franchise, is the Mirage F1 by Argus. And this aircraft has been incredibly well received, and it got its biggest update thus far. And I had a little tinker with it the other night, and I was quite pleased, and I felt very rewarded by the new physics of the flight model, which I think are much improved. To me, it felt a lot less twitchy and more predictable, and they also fixed the engine sounds, which I think were a placeholder. Now, of course, that is just a snippet of the changes for the aircraft that has seen, as I said, probably the biggest list of improvements out of all the aircraft this week and other adjustments as well since its release. Some are obviously aesthetic and involve the intensity of lighting in the cockpit and various illuminated switches through to complex changes to the IFF system and also radio functionality. 
It's a lovely little aircraft and I really just wish I had more time to fly it more often. But let me know what you think about this improvement and the ongoing development of this aircraft. I think it's a great addition to the game. Let me know if you agree or if you have some other experiences with it. Now, of course, in all of these updates, I will refer you to the changelog for a fuller explanation of this comprehensive patch. I can't do justice to everything here with an overview of this nature, and it's just too many things to go through line by line. But as you can gather, pretty much everything got an update in terms of aircraft, and there were some changes to the core game as well, as mentioned, the physics for the engines on the World War II aircraft, among other things. So it's a good step forward for several aircraft. Now I think this brings us to the end of another DCS sit rep. Before we go, of course, ED plugged the Enigma server, which we have discussed in the past due to the increasing number of Cold War aircraft, which are swelling the ranks of our flying choices to complete missions in that environment. The servers apparently swap between the Syrian theater and the Caucasus and provide a variety of mission sets, uh, air to ground and cap and surveillance and all sorts of things. So if that's something that you're interested in, might be worth checking out. I haven't played on the server myself, it does hold some appeal, so let me know what you think. If you've had experiences with the Enigma server, what it's like to fly on there, uh, maybe let the community know in the comment section below and pass on some of your wisdom, pass on some of your experiences, because I know it's a very, very popular server and a lot of people are interested in these Cold War jets, which, as I said, seem to be coming out almost every week. Uh, certainly the maps uh, are coming out what, what appears to be almost every week, but we are really being spoiled for choice right now from Eagle Dynamics, which, you know, it's not a bad thing, i got to say. Well, this brings us to the end properly. If you like today's update, let me know in the comments section below, or you can start a discussion on what we've covered uh, on one of the other topics. If you like the channel and want more news, don't forget to subscribe to keep up with more news about the DCS environment, like and share, or you can use the super thanks to support the channel a little more if you desire. Thanks for watching everyone. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the feedback and the comments and the support for the channel. We'll see you next time on the DCS Situation Report.